like to remind you right now that our dirs are upstairs standing, so uh, just direct the stairs, catch a little action up there. We're with you all day, so. Bob just told me this is a serious raw bar. Thank you. 
it up for, for P and C. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, uh... 
he was saying, <laughs> there are some great accomplishments you guys have made over the past uh, couple of years. And I know it means an awful lot to you. But uh, from a corporate perspective, we look at things with much broader you know, macro vision. And so, uh, <laughs> and music by you is beautiful. Lose that fun now. See, what we're actually looking for uh, out of you people is to get to a point where we have uh, <laughs> it's called the Einstein effect. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's, the basic principle is this. We make tons of art, and we don't have anyone working for us. <laughs>
so we're going to start uh, uh, again uh, to uh, talk about uh, the President Award. Uh, Lou is going to uh, explain to us uh, why we got it, why it is important, what it means for us, what it means for you, and uh, then we'll... Uh, Thank you, Pierre, and uh, good morning. And yeah, I guess it's still morning. Uh, it is nice to be here again, and it's uh, especially my pleasure to be here this time to give you the President's Quality Award. This is the uh, uh, actually the eighth time that I will have given out a President's Quality Award. We did seven of them last year. Uh, this is the first one for 1995. And I must say, it's a different experience than the uh, experience that I've had in the past. Um, I have never had the opportunity to give out a President's Quality Award uh, at a uh, facility that we're closing. So uh, this is uh, definitely a different experience for me, uh, as I'm sure it is for you. On the other hand, um, you really deserve it. And that's why I decided that uh, you should be given the award and why I decided I would come here. Uh, you so clearly won the award based on all of the criteria that we had established uh, that it was very clear that we should give it to you, even though I think it uh, certainly brings up some pain in many of your minds. I know I've looked over some questions that you've sent in about, you know, why, uh, why give an award like this to a, a facility we're closing down. I think the simple answer is that you earned it. Uh, you were a walk-away winner last year. Nobody was uh, uh, really close in terms of, uh, uh, of being such a clear winner as you were. So it really is my pleasure to be here today. Um, a little bittersweet as it is to recognize your really uh, incredible performance last year. Now what does it take to win the President's Quality Award? I think all of you know that it takes a, a QMS score uh, at a certain level or a survey score parts of earning the President's Quality Award. Lots of people have learned about quality and have practiced quality. Uh, the winners are people who have practiced it in a way that achieves real success for our company. You've done all of those things. You've demonstrated uh, through the three employee survey scores that have been taken here increasing results each time. You've had a wonderful track record in terms of your financial performance. You've ramped up uh, shipments out of this facility really quite dramatically, uh, doubling them over a very short period of time. So you really are, uh, I guess you'd say wieners. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, isn't that what you'd say? Wieners? in every way that's important uh, for giving out this award. So I am pleased to be here this morning. Uh, it will probably be the most unusual President's Quality Award I ever do uh, in my entire life. You did win it. You won it fair and square. You won it going away. It's something no one will ever be able to take away from you. And it's something that uh, those of you who are moving on to other jobs, uh, either in CIC or, or other jobs in HP or outside. I think you can take it with you very proudly as part of your resume. It's a sure signal to everybody out there uh, that you're not leaving a facility that's failing. You're leaving a facility that has won big time and has achieved a very significant distinction. After all, uh, there have only been, uh, by the time this year is over, only 12 President's Quality Awards out of the hundreds that could have been awarded, uh, that puts you in a really classic league. So it's my pleasure to present the award today. I'm going to present it to three employees who I understand were chosen from among you to accept the award. Uh, if the three of you would come up, uh, I'd like to give you the award officially now. Uh, Chris Kim, Frank Wentworth, and Ernie Vines. Uh, 
look at the award. Um, it's a piece of art that I actually uh, selected myself. Uh, I like it a lot. I'd like to just tell you a little bit about it. There's a lot of symbolism here. Tall figures reaching high, uh, reaching, really striving for new heights. You'll notice the intertwined arms, the symbolism of the kind of teamwork uh, that it takes to achieve this award. Every single uh, winner uh, has been able to demonstrate uncommon teamwork. By the way, one of the things that you demonstrated here was that uh, you really had total per participation. As a matter of fact, your QMS score for total participation uh, is the highest in the company, the highest that's ever been achieved. So that kind of teamwork and total participation, uh, which is symbolized by the interlocked arms, um, the really strong, heavy bass, which I'm now beginning to have some, here, here you go. <laughs> About four years ago, I guess, and when we decided to give this award, we looked her up and commissioned uh, this piece uh, that she did for us. So, again, not many of those things around. Uh, it's a very rare item. I hope you uh, always look at it uh, with a sense of great pride for what you've been able to accomplish here. I'd like to thank you on behalf of HP for the accomplishments that led to the winning of this award. This is a really big deal. Stanley Cup to carry around here in Boston. So. Back when I lived here, we used to win the Stanley Cup pretty often, but those are the old days. So, so I was supposed to uh, give a little speech to, but somebody has already used my time. Uh, so I'm not going to do it. I uh, just want to, uh, I mean, I think Lou uh, pretty much uh, said everything we had, we had, he, had, he had to say and I had to say, you know, I think it's a great achievement for everybody here. And uh, I can share, you know, and I think I already did share that with you. Uh, we were really uh, wondering whether we would go after the award because of, we, we knew we were shutting down. And uh, so we had some kind of a heated discussion in the staff. And we felt like, okay, not to go for it because, I mean, it's, each of you who uh, uh, participated in uh, winning, uh, is that, I said it well, in winning that award. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, you own that stuff, you know, it's not ECMO, it's not uh, the staff, it's not, it's each of you own part of that uh, uh, sculpture, part of that award. Uh, each of you own, in fact, more, more than the award, you own what this award means to HP means to our customers and uh, you should feel really, really good, proud about it. Uh, whatever your other feelings may be, you know, that's, that's a highlight uh, in, in a professional career, I think. And that's uh, an individual highlight for each of you. It has nothing to do with this organization. I mean, the organization is a result of your individual contributions. And so you own that stuff very clearly. So, uh, we are supposed to, I know I'm, I'm screwing the agenda here. So, uh, I don't know where Stania is. <laughs> Uh, we just look at, yeah, we have a champagne toast, thanks Lou. Uh, so, uh, I don't have a glass. <laughs> so guys, to uh, you all and to Lou, congratulations. So, uh, so 
Uh, as usual, uh, we have uh, reserve time for uh, questions and answers. So you had about 15 questions for Lou, and uh, I know he was looking forward to answering some of those questions. So Lou, you are back on stage. <laughs> I don't know if he's looking forward, he's good to do it anyway. So. <laughs> Well, that's, I wouldn't say I'm actually looking forward to answering these questions, but I said that I would while I'm here, and, uh, and I will. Is it loud enough? I know you can hear, but of course you can hear back there. Okay, the, the first two questions are actually very, uh, uh, very like in nature, so I'm going to kind of combine them. And guess what they have to do with it? offerings? Why are they no longer being offered to excess employees? And how do we just how do you justify this change in options, especially given the fact that employees and when we would like the organization to basically get smaller, that is, we would like people to go away. Uh, in the case of the change that we're making here, we really don't want people to leave. Uh, we need you uh, working in other jobs in HP. We need you working uh, for our CIC contractor. And so therefore we have decided not to offer uh, VSI this time because in fact uh, we do not want to pay people to leave the company. The people in Roseville, we're offering VSI to people in McMinnville right now, uh, to people in um, Boise. And we're doing it quite simply because we do not have other jobs for those people. We have not seen uh, some of those people leave the organization. Uh, I think, and I'm going to go on and just make a comment here, I think it's a tribute to this organization that we actually would like you to say. Uh, you have done a good job. It's clear you've done a good job. It's clear that it's a great group of people. And I think the very fact that you are being offered jobs in HP and with a contractor at a time when other HP sites are going through downsizing without any internal uh, alternatives uh, should be a signal to you that we really do appreciate the good work that you've done here. Uh, you are being treated differently. Uh, you've earned that. Oh. Being filled with temporary people. And the second uh, relates to skill mix. Uh, we just don't have quite the right skill mix of people uh, from this organization to put into those jobs and where we don't have the right skills then that uh, that job is being opened up as a temporary job so it's really to take care of peak demand that will go away and skill mix why is it when a call is made to corporate personnel regarding this transition no one returns the calls well, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Ralph and I talked about that this morning, and we will find out for you. Um, I guess one of the one of the questions is, where are you calling uh, in in personnel? If whoever submitted this question would come up to Ralph uh, Ralph sometime later and explain the situation, uh, maybe we can find out. We have a pretty rigorous process that I put in place about two years ago for any call that comes in either to my office or to Pete Peterson's office, uh, we actually log every single call, every single desk message, every single voicemail, every single memo. Uh, we keep track of it until it's resolved. So uh, we are working to try and make sure that people get answers to questions. Um, if it was a random call and to some other part of personnel that somehow went around this, this process, uh, then we need to, to deal with it. So whoever sent in this question, if you could come and see Ralph later, uh, we will work on getting it resolved for you. You should always get an answer to your question. It is said that reduction of the operating expense and better management of manufacturing costs are two big issues for, the H for HP. But it seems to me that the reorganization is severer in the factory side than in the sales side. What kind of efforts are you expecting in regards of the sales side reorganization? Uh, right now, uh, the reorganization effort is more severe uh, in the manufacturing side than it is in the sales side. Uh, historically, that has not been true. Uh, starting in uh, when I actually moved into CSO in 1990, uh, we have downsized the sales organization every single year. Uh, it is now about two-thirds of the size that it was uh, uh, just uh, four years ago. 
So there has been an ongoing downsizing of the sales organization, including this year. So I think what you're seeing is that, uh, yes, it's hitting particular, particularly hard in manufacturing right now, but we have worked on all parts of the organization over the past several years. As a matter of fact, CSO in total uh, is about 60% of the size that it was um, four years ago. So there's been constant downsizing in administrative areas, sales, marketing, uh, and unfortunately even in R&D. So um, I think really there, if you look at the numbers over a longer period of time, uh, manufacturing is uh, not really contributing any more to this downsizing activity than the other functions are, with the possible exception, by the way, of, of R&D. HP's R&D spending used to be over 10% of revenue. It's now declined to, declined to about 8.1% of revenue. When you think about the fact that R&D spending is the basis of future growth, is this R&D investment still high enough? Or do you think any, are, are you thinking of any specific field to invest in? Uh, the, uh, the facts are right. Uh, historically, our R&D spending has been about 10%. It's about 8% now by design. Uh, if you look at different businesses, the R&D spending levels are quite different. Uh, it still is near its historic 10% levels uh, in test and measurement and in CSO, by the way. Uh, areas like CPO, uh, where uh, we are basically putting out very high volumes of PCs and printers, we have intentionally brought our R&D down to the 4 and 5% levels. Uh, that's what it takes to compete in that business. Also, given the huge volumes of printers that you put out, we ship a million printers a month now, a million printers a month. You don't have to invest 10% in R&D to keep up. We have a, an R&D program that's uh, probably three times larger than the next largest competitor, and we spend about four or five percent. So if you look across the company, when you blend in CPO, which is now spending five or six percent, with the rest of the company, which is still spending at historical levels of about 10 percent, uh, that's how you get eight. So I think we are investing appropriately. We're certainly making plenty of um, long-term investments at uh, HP Laboratories. Uh, we're investing in lots of new startup activities. Uh, I feel very comfortable about the investment levels at this point in time. And they're really not any different from historic levels for those businesses that look like they did uh, 10 or 20 years ago. The next question is really uh, two questions. The first part being that earthquakes were identified as a risk to the company in the latest annual report. What plans are in place to minimize the effect of an earthquake? <laughs> First of all, I, I really don't remember mentioning that in the annual report, but it might be in there. And it is a risk to the company. We've known that for a long time. Uh, the major risk, we think, is in the information systems area. Obviously, there's a risk to people as well. So, I mean, we're very careful about the way we build our buildings in earthquake-prone uh, areas. We spent a lot of time and money making sure that our buildings meet all the latest codes so that they're safe for our employees. Beyond that, the real risk to the company is information systems. We have a complete backup information systems uh, uh, are basically able to transfer all of our uh, corporate uh, activities, including all of our corporate communications uh, that are done in the California area. Uh, to Colorado, so that's where we have our backup uh, IT facilities, and uh, we think that we're ver in very good shape for doing a, I mean, nearly instant switchover. If necessary, we could run all of the corporate IT activities that are now done in California out of uh, Colorado. The second part of the question is, uh, with regards to, already touched on this question, we have been working on all categories of expenses, not just manufacturing, for many years now. Uh, the company's expense ratios, that's total expenses as a, uh, as a percent of revenue, have d dropped 12 percentage points uh, in the last five years. So that says that we brought down administration, R&D, I've already talked about marketing, uh, and, and uh, field selling costs quite dramatically, and our plans are to continue to do that. Our plan is to drop that ratio by about two percentage points every year 
uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, whatever happened to channel marketing, um, it is alive, um, I should, I'm not going to say alive and well, it's alive and frankly could be doing better. Uh, I think it needs some more attention. HP has a wonderful channel marketing program for CPO products. All of our CPO products, $10 billion worth, that's with a B, $10 billion worth a year, go through channels. Uh, CSO has had a hard time getting its program geared up uh, to use those same channels, uh, primarily because we haven't yet uh, really engineered the right products to put through those channels. And I think once we get that done, uh, we will have a very successful channel program, just like CPO does. In a recent new gram, Mexico operations. Is HP becoming an international foundling with no loyalties except to those which enrich HP at the expense of others? And how does the policy reinforce HP's reputation as an employer of choice for its U.S. operations? Wow. <laughs> there are a lot of questions in there. Let me, let me take them one at a time, actually. Uh, there are several things buried in there. Let's start with the Mexican bailout. I did support President Clinton. I actually wrote him a letter encouraging him to... Uh, to do it. Uh, by the way, I actually had an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with him for a couple of minutes on uh, Wednesday night, and uh, he said that he received thousands of letters from business people like me around the, the country supporting him. I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, I think it was important that we not let Mexico go under. Uh, I think uh, it's important to the American people that we don't let Mexico go under. I thought it was important that he use his powers, and what he did was perfectly legal, that he use his powers to act very quickly, because I didn't think that he had time to wait for Congress to approve what he was doing. Uh, I mean, it was literally down to a matter of hours, and we were going to have a huge fiscal crisis and perhaps an outbreak of civil unrest in Mexico, so I thought it was a good thing to do. You will note, if you read the newspapers, that Congress has not been particularly upset that he did that, and they've given him his full support uh, that he's asked for. So I think if he had done anything that was very far out of line, Congress would have been all over, and particularly a Republican Congress, and they have not. Why did, why did I think it's important to support Mexico? Um, and this will start to get into the answer to the rest of the questions. We have a very good business in Mexico. We do half a billion dollars, that's $500 million of business in Mexico every year. We have a manufacturing organization in Mexico. Uh, it manufactures about $100 million of that $500 million that we sell there every year. Where does the other $400 million come from? Where do you think? Facilities just like this one right here in Exeter, right out of the United States. We have $400 million of U.S. exports pouring into Mexico. So I think by protecting Mexico, making sure that they're fiscally solvent, making sure that they don't have some kind of civil war down there because they're on the edge of that, uh, I not only protected HP jobs in Mexico, but I know that I protected HP jobs here in the U.S. As a general rule, every time we make an investment overseas, for every overseas job we generate, we generate two of them here in the U.S. Uh, we're selling $250 million a year in China. We're manufacturing $50 million there. The other $200 million is coming in from mostly the U.S. So, believe me, we are not exporting U.S. jobs. By making these moves into Russia, into China, into Mexico, by having a substantial local presence there, which alert allows us to get a big share of that market, we are actually generating U.S. jobs. And I can prove that to you. Uh, I've actually proved it uh, to lots of HP employees when, I'm, when given enough time. Uh, the numbers are there uh, that it makes a, a very clear proof. here so we can get on with the party. We selected one last question. 
I read your President's Award message in the latest issue of CSO Inside. In it, you stated that ECM01, as well as was shutting operations as an HP facility in Exeter, due to needed changes in the business model for the future. We are in the process of going through the changes in order to support the model. However, I'm still unclear as to the long-range model. I understand about the Intel Alliance and the need to become more of a commodity. Could you elaborate a little further, and do you see workstations and PCs merging in the future? Um, I think there are still a number of things that are, uh, while many things are clear, there are still a number of things that are probably unclear about exactly where everything will end up. But let me start by saying that uh, I do see a merger uh, between certainly the low end of the workstation line and the PC line in the future. Uh, we're going to make that happen, basically. I mean, we're driving that uh, in the Intel Alliance. And it's going to be to HP's benefit that we are the drivers of that. We're going to put some of our other competitors in a very tough spot. So yes, uh, at some point in the future, maybe 97 or 98, you're going to see a set of products uh, where at least the hardware uh, will be common between PCs and low-end workstations. We will always have higher-end workstations that will be differentiated from PCs. So I don't see any, um, at least not in my plan, I don't see any plan to completely merge the two organizations. But we do need to uh, get ready for the commodity product era, certainly at the low and medium range of workstations. We need to find ways to leverage the volume uh, of our PC business and the volume of our workstation business so that uh, we look like the highest volume supplier around. All these things really represent good opportunities for us and should not present particularly disruptive organization changes downstream. Thanks, Lou. Let's well, party. Yeah, let's party. I agree. Let's party. Before we get, before we party, uh, I, I don't think this is on the agenda, but I need to do so. Personal holiday, so to speak, day off. Right, right. Uh, and the second thing before we, we get into it is, there's a bunch of uh, terrific women sitting all over here in, in yellow, I think, jerseys. And they need to stand up because they organized this whole thing. And Tanya and the rest of you, please. Tanya, Peter said you were standing up. <laughs> Let's party. This announcement is probably one of the most important announcements. And we're going to turn it over to Reverend Glenn Hammond for an announcement about the tables. Glenn, the coordinator. Is this a pink one here? Is a green one? So, when we, so everybody who's standing in line, when we go to get our food, we're going to call callers at random. <laughs> yes, that's what I heard, too. Go ahead. So, Buffalo Eyes are turning.